Hello, my name is Rachel Vay and I'm a Senior Technical Consultant here at AJ Bell. The subject for today's webinar is the FCA Investment Pathways process. This is a set of FCA rules which come into effect on the 1st of February 2021 and they will help non-advised customers make better investment decisions. So, because they're coming into effect in February, it's worth knowing how they're going to work in practice. This is a significant development for the FCA. It demonstrates the FCA's direction of travel to automatically give solutions to non-advised pension customers. And this ethos is going to be rolled out to other areas of the pensions journey. So today, what I want to do is to help you understand the new investment pathways process and how providers might be exempted from providing an investment pathway fund. I want to go through the challenges advisors may face with the introduction of the new investment pathways process. And finally, I want to identify what other changes the government and regulators are considering for default funds and guidance. On the face of it, investment pathways should have no impact on financial advisors and planners. They only affect non-advised customers, but they do have an effect. It changes a couple of key areas for advisors. But to explain these impacts, the best way is to start by explaining the process and the rules for investment pathways, including exempt firms. We can then discuss the challenges for advisors arising from these new rules. I then want to finish by looking at the place Investment Pathways has in the regulators and the DWP's current work to help customers make better decisions. But before we start all that, let's have a reminder about how Investment Pathways works and why they were introduced. The FCA wanted to introduce them to look at non-advised drawdown customers those people who were unsure where the pension fund was invested. They did some work over the last few years, Retirement Outcomes Review, and this has come out with a couple of key policy papers. The last one was issued in July 2019, and it showed that non-advised drawdown customers were generally confused about their investment choices. Sometimes they didn't know what investment choice they had made. Sometimes it just didn't align with their retirement objectives. There was also a worryingly high number of them invested solely in cash. And sometimes this was just rolled over as part of um, the move from going from um, accumulation to a drawdown policy. So the FCA were worried and wanted to take action to address these problems. So let's start by having a look at the rules for investment pathways. What are investment pathways? Right, well, this is um, all set out in the policy statement, which was issued in July 2019. And it is a prescribed three-step process. The rules are highly prescribed. They're not outlining what outcome the FCA wanted to achieve and then leaving it up to providers and to scheme administrators to try and figure out how to get there. Instead, they are setting out every step of the way what information they expect to see to go to um, non-advised customers and what questions to ask and the text of what should be there. There are three main steps. The end point is to offer a customer a default investment fund, which is based on their objective in drawdown. In addition to this, if the invest customer didn't choose investment pathways, and they may chose their own investments or they decided to stick with their current investments, then if they have an unusually high amount of cash or they're invested in an unusually high amount of cash, then the FCA wants to make sure the provider gets an active decision from the client that that's what they have chosen to do, to invest that much in cash. All these rules come into place on the 1st of February, 2021. So only a couple of months away now. And all in providers have to incorporate them for non-advised customers. 
unless they've only got a few non-advised customers. And in that case, they can be exempt from just one small part of the process. The process must be followed when, the, when one of two trigger events happens. The first trigger event is to designate part of all of your fund into um, drawdown. And the second trigger event is a drawdown to drawdown transfer. The whole of the process is written around this, these two events. So it's all built around the transaction to either go into drawdown or to do a drawdown to drawdown transfer. So let's have a look at this three-step process in more detail. Step one, the customer is asked what do they want to do with their investment for their drawdown plan? Would they like to go into investment pathways? Would they like to choose their own investments? Or would they like to stick with the current investments? If they are unsure about that answer, then the rules say that we have to take them through the investment pathway process. At step one, if they choose investment pathways or they are unsure, then we take them through to step two. Step two is to pick an option, an objective, which is based on what they want to do with their drawdown pot over the next five years. There are only four options. Option one, I have no plans to touch my money in the next five years. Option two, I plan to set up a guaranteed income in the next five years. Option three, I plan to start taking a long-term income within the next five years. And the final one, option four, I plan to take out all my money in the next five years. Once the client has chosen which option best suits them, they are then offered a pathway investment fund that matches that option, which matches that objective. At that point, the provider then describes how risky the fund is. They'll give the client a lot more details about the fund, but we'll also mention that they can shop around and they can get other investment pathway funds from other providers. And if they don't want that pathway investment fund, then they can choose their own investments. There are other options available. At that point, the provider also has to direct the customer to the MAPS comparator. Now, MAPS is the money and pension service, and it has devised a comparator looking at a few um, providers who offer pathway investments. This comparator will run through a few of these providers and the client can have a look and see which one of these they prefer. They'll be able to see how much the costs and charges are going to be for the first year as well by using this comparator. I'll come back to the comparator later on. Once the client has chosen which particular objective they want, they'll be offered the Pathway Investment Fund and then they'll be given information such as this. This just describes, so they'll be looking at how risky the fund is, whether it's the right fund for them, and they'll be given some information about the asset allocation. Once the client has been taken through the investment pathways process, then they need to look, make sure that they have made an active decision to invest in cash. Now, this doesn't apply if the client has chosen investment pathways, but if the client has decided to stick with their current investments, then first of all, the provider needs to remind the client just to check with whether their current investments matches their investment objectives. So if the client has decided to stick with their current investments or they have chosen new investments, there is another check. If more than 50% of their fund is invested in cash, then the provider has to make sure that the client has made an active decision to invest more than 50% of their fund in cash. They've also got to give them an initial cash warning. And the initial cash warning will just outline the um, 
what will happen with inflation and how inflation can reduce the fund. At this point, they've got to remind them again that they can shop around, that they can get some more information by the MAPS comparator, and that advice and guidance is available. This step to make sure that you get an active decision from the client and that you give initial cash warning has to happen before the client designates drawdown or before the provider accepts the transfer from another drawdown policy. Let's look at this a little bit more in detail. First of all, cash. Cash or cash-like investments. So what is cash? Well, the new rules outline that cash-like investments include cash or near cash, units in a regulated money market fund, or units in a fund authorised as a money market fund. So that's a, a description of what sort of cash funds we're looking at. And you can see that goes beyond just a simple bank account. Each provider will have a look at the funds that are on offer to their clients and have a look at what, the, what customers can pick. Undoubtedly, some providers may choose different funds and, designate, and decide that they are cash or cash-like, and this might differ between providers. The second question is 50% of what? Well, is 50% of the drawdown fund or if you cannot separate a drawdown fund from the whole of the fund, then it's 50% of the SIP fund. However, this requirement doesn't apply if there's a DFM or a financial advisor who has permission for more than 50% of the drawdown fund. So for situations where the client isn't receiving advice on the transaction, but they are receiving advice on the investment, then we won't have to ask them to make an active cash decision. Even once the investment pathway process is finished and the client has designated into drawdown and they've received their cash and they have changed their investment to an investment pathway fund. Once the process has been complete, then there is still information we need to give the client. This is part of the annual statement. We need to remind the client which investment pathway objective they chose, how much they have invested in the investment pathway fund and what the current value is. We also need to remind them what, they invest, what other objectives they could have chosen and what other funds are available. And that's to prompt them into maybe changing their mind about what their objective is and therefore what investment pathway fund they should be invested in. We also have to monitor what action the client takes and what the customer does. For example, let's say a customer chose to invest in um, objective number one, where they don't touch their money for the first five years. But then we become aware that they are actually taking withdrawals. We need to then get in touch with them and to remind them about which objective they selected in the first place. And that's a prompt for them to maybe reconsider what their investment objectives are and to reconsider what investment pathway fund they should be invested in. If they originally received an initial cash warning and then after a year they haven't changed their investment and they are still invested more than 50% in cash, then they need to receive an ongoing cash warning. Again, warning about the dangers of inflation eroding the fund. At this point, we're looking to see whether the client or whether the customer is receiving investment advice on the, uh, on the investment of their drawdown fund. So it's slightly different definition of what a non-advised customer is. Another big change coming forward is changes to the annual statement. Now, this isn't just for non-advised customers. This is for all drawdown customers. The annual statement from April next year will show the actual costs and charges that somebody has incurred for the first year and every subsequent year of their drawdown plan. Again, if the provider can't show the 
charges specific to the drawdown element, then they can show the charges for the whole of the SIP plan. So you're looking at any charge that the drawdown provider might make or a third party might make. So we're looking at platform charges. We're also looking at advisor charges, transactional charges. If they have a property, then the cost for the property, for example, solicitor charges, and also investment management charges. So this is to give the client a complete picture of how much money their drawdown is costing them each year. Now, some of this information is easy for a provider to give, and some of it's going to be a little bit more difficult, especially if the investment is with a third party. The provider has to make a reasonable effort to try and get this information. But there is no compunction on the third party to provide that information if they don't want to do so. We can ask them very nicely for the information and in a format that's going to suit us to be able to put it into an annual statement. But there is no obligation for that third party to give us that, the details of the costs and charges. Or they may have the details, but it refers to a different time frame to the one that the annual statement is showing. For example, the annual statement could run on a tax year and the costs and charges provided by the third party could be for a calendar year. Well, even if, once reasonable efforts have been made, if it's too difficult to actually do, then the provider doesn't need to include the charge, but they do need to explain that to the customer as part of the annual statement. The new rules for investment pathways also include uh, details of what providers and scheme administrators have to do for record keeping. And these are fairly onerous. The FCA are not really interested in just what happened. They're trying to get to the, uh, to the reason of what happened to the client, what decisions they made and why they made them. So they're asking for quite a range of information. They're asking for things you might expect, for example, who chose investment pathways, who chose their own investments, who chose to um, stick with the current investments. But where the client has been offered an investment pathway, because they have fund, because they have chosen a specific objective, but then decided to do something else, the SCA also wants us to capture those types of situations as well. Now that might be reasonably easy to do in a telephone call. If I'm on a telephone call with you, for example, I might say, well, which objective do you want? Oh, you want objective number one, well, that leads you to this specific fund. And this is how the fund will work. This is the riskiness of it. This is the asset allocation. And then you go, actually, do you know what? I don't want that one. I want number two instead. And that way I can record that thought process. But if all the information is outlined in a uh, form, in a paper form, I can't, the providers can't capture that. The FCA also wants to know what the people did if they didn't invest. Did they, they just choose their own investments or did they transfer? They also want to know who was given an initial cash warning and who's been given ongoing cash warnings. Did they invest any differently after being given the initial cash warning? So this is all to try and figure out whether the investment pathways is working in the way that the FCA envisages. So that's the process for investment pathways and for active cash decisions. As you can see, it's quite detailed. Has it been a smooth pathway in incorporating these new rules? I don't think it really has been. They're highly prescribed and set out in very great detail what providers have to do at each stage. And sometimes that just doesn't fit um, the models the providers use. You also have to question whether they're following a flawed logic. What we are asking someone to do is to invest at one single point, the whole of their SIP fund in one fund. And that sort of goes against the grain of how um, SIPs and how investment decisions are made. You know that the diversification is so important to invest in a wide range of assets rather than one specific fund. 
they're also investing um, clients are being shown investment funds without being asked first of all what their risk appetite is or what their capacity for loss is something that feels really quite alien now is help being offered at the right time we have to offer this help at the point that the client wants to get hold of their investments and wants to access their cash uh, their tax free cash at this point, they've already been through a decision-making process. They probably have decision fatigue. At this moment, all they want to do is to get the cash. And this is just putting maybe another barrier in, their pl in the way of, of being able to achieve that. A lot of this is centered around this particular point, the point of access. And although there is information in an annual statement going out to the client, it is only a prompt, and you wonder if clients will really read the annual statement. Drawdown is a complicated process, and the complicated decisions involved don't stop once you've put the money into drawdown or once you've taken the tax-free cash. They continue for the next 20 or 30 years. So maybe we should be doing more to help clients understand that and review their investments and to review their withdrawal rates as well every single year. That will make a massive difference to whether the fund can be sustainable for the rest of their lifetime. And as I said, the investment pathway process is highly prescriptive, but not all clients are the same. Not all non-advised clients don't understand investments. Some of them are not engaged. Some of them don't want to be engaged. They're not interested. And those are the ones we need to help. Some of them are highly engaged and know exactly what they're doing and exactly where they want their funds invested. But we are putting another process in their way of do before they can achieve that. And as I said before, not all provider models are the same. A lot of this, um, some of them are insurance companies and some of them are platform SIPs and they work very differently in practice. For a platform SIP, the investment decision is different to the transaction. Somebody will make a decision whether to take drawdown, but then laterally decide how they want their monies invested. The two things aren't wrapped up together. And a cash fund is a very important element of a drawdown fund in a platform SIP. Contributions are paid into cash. Withdrawals are taken from the cash fund. It is naturally going to be higher than if it was within an insurance company SIP. So we've been through the investment pathway process and now I want to go on to why some firms may be exempt. So who are the exempt providers? Well, they have to be satisfied on reasonable grounds that they have fewer than 500 members 500 clients who want to take drawdown in the next 12 months. And if they do, if they have fewer than 500 they think are going to go into drawdown, then they can apply for exemption. And they can say, what we don't want to do is to offer pathway investment funds. Now, when they're working this out, they're going to look at, obviously, at how many people took drawdown last year and the year before, but also what the future plans for the provider is. So, for example, if they think that they're going to push into the D to C market, then obviously they, they wouldn't be applying for exemption. So what exactly are they exempt from? Well, they're only exempt from offering investment pathway funds. Now, if you remember the three step process, all they are exempt from is step three. So they still have to comply with the first two steps. They still have to say to a non-advised customer, would you like investment pathways? Stick with your own investments, current investments, or would you like to choose new ones? And they still have to ask them which investment pathway objective they would choose. It's only when they get to step three that they are exempt. They still have to do the cash active decision and still make sure that people make those decisions. And they still have to look at a large part of the record keeping as well. 
So instead of offering a client investment pathway funds, they can refer the client to the money and pension service comparator. Or they may want to um, get a deal with another firm and offer the and refer the clients to this other provider. Although in practice, I think that's probably quite unlikely. If they offer refer the client to the MAPS comparator, then the client's going to go to the MAPS comparator, have a look at those firms that offer do investment pathways and those providers that offer investment pathways, and then maybe choose one and say, do you know, that one looks really great. That's the one for me. They go back to their exempt provider and say, OK, I want to go for that particular one. But the exempt provider then has to say to them, well, if you want it, you have to transfer your, your drawdown from this company to that new company. Now, that sort of goes against the grain of why the person ended up in the, in the exempt provider drawdown to start off with. So in reality, I wonder how many people will actually follow the process through and then transfer to a new provider. So as you can see, by following this exemption process, there's not really that much that the drawdown provider is going to be exempt from. But I think a large reason of why some people may choose this and some providers may choose this particular option is because they don't have to carry out the governance. If you do investment pathways and you offer investment pathway funds, then you have to make sure that you have an IGC or a GAA, a governance committee, to look at the investment pathway funds to make sure they're appropriate and to make sure they offer value for money. Governance committees are not a cheap option. They come with a quite an expensive price tag. So it's likely that many providers might choose not to take this route because of the cost of the governance. So it really isn't a get out of jail free card. Let's look now at the challenges for advisors. We've been through the investment pathway process. We know the rules. We know who's going to be exempt. What does it mean for you? Well, the first thing to say is that investment pathways do affect providers. It does mean changing some of your processes. And there are two key elements why. The first is over the definition of non-advised customers. And then the second is when you are giving investment advice to customers. So let's look at those two things separately. The first question is, who is non-advised? Now, to figure that out, we need to look at the definitions within the rules for investment pathways. And the FCA has outlined that a non-advised customer is where the firm has said that they haven't received a personal recommendation on the transaction within the last 12 months. OK, so it's whether they have received advice on the designation to drawdown or the drawdown to drawdown transfer within the last 12 months. If they have, if you have only given them advice on the investment and not the transaction, then as far as the investment pathway rules are concerned, that customer will be non-advised. Let's see how this could work in practice. I have an example here. This is Gary. Gary has a SIP and it's worth £200,000. He goes to see his advisor and on the back of a personal recommendation from his advisor, he designates £100,000 into drawdown and he takes £25,000 cash. So that still leaves him with £100,000 in his accumulations part of his SIP. 18 months later, he decides he needs a little bit more cash for an emergency. He only needs a small amount. Um, he's already designated part of his fund into drawdown. And so he doesn't go and get a full personal recommendation to get the next £10,000 slice. He just gets in touch with the provider and he says, I just need a little bit more money. 80 months later, I've already done you know, a fair, um, half of my fund already. I just need a little bit more and just to get this £2,500 cash. So he doesn't get a personal recommendation from his advisor on this later action. And that means he's non-advised and he has to be taken through the investment pathway process. 
Now, that's not the end of the world. It's quite simple to go through. It's maybe a little bit of a barrier for Gary, but it's not, it's not a massive problem. But it's worth understanding what information your customer is going to be given as part of that process so that you understand what choices Gary is going to be given. And he might go exploring what the investment pathway options are and what the objectives are and what the resulting pathway investment funds are going to look like as well. The second part which may affect you is when you're giving investment advice. Now, the COBS, new COBS rules, the new investment pathways rules say that if you are an advisor is giving a personal recommendation to a client about how they're going to invest their drawdown funds, then they need to include consideration of pathway investments. Now, this is going to change your process slightly for how you do, um, you do investment um, advice for drawdown. You're going to have to build in looking at pathway investments. So maybe start off by considering which of those pathway options, those four objectives, your client would choose. Now, I realize it's really simplified. We're just bringing the whole of drawdown advice to uh, for, um, for questions. But that's what we've got to do. So maybe have a look at that. Choose which one is going to be the most appropriate for your client. And then maybe consider wh whether um, what pathway investment funds that they could receive on the back of it and which pathway investment funds they may invest in. Now, when you're putting together your response about consideration of pathway investments, this isn't rocket science. This is a really quite an easy process, I would imagine, for, for all of you to do. The pathway investments and the investment pathway process is quite a simplified process. Within the advice that you give your clients, you're going to be looking at a lot more information. You're going to be looking at different time frames. You're going to be considering the, the risk appetite of your clients, the capacity for loss, cash flow considerations. You're going to be looking at um, a diversification. You're going to be in building an investment strategy for your clients. So this is all quite easy to, to bat away for want of a better expression but you do need to do it and you do need to include it within your process. You may also want to have a look at the MAPS comparator. Now, as I said before, this is a drawdown tool offered by MAPS, which gives um, a run through a few of the providers who are offering investment pathway funds. So you can see the details of what they are offering, what types of investment they're offering. Now, these are actually quite wide ranging and different providers have come up with different types of solutions with varying risk, um, uh, varying risk categories of funds and the solutions they brought forward and different charges as well, quite a range of charges. So it's probably worth having a look at that once that's up and running and it will be up and running by um, the beginning of February to build that into your process and to maybe refer to it. So as I said before, none of this is rocket science. It's probably quite an easy tweak for you to make to your um, to your process but it is important that you do so and it's important that you give it due consideration within your process because the FCA will be checking. Now for you some of you may be old enough to remember RU64. This was a rule that was brought in when stakeholders were launched and the rule was that if you're going to recommend a personal pension then you have to be sure that it is a better solution for your client than a stakeholder pension. Now, because I have been around in pensions for so long now, these current rules for investment pathway investment remind me of the RU64 rule. And again, it seems to be that we are evoking that rule. We're saying that if you're going to invest in a, a, an, an investment strategy for drawdown, that has to be better for the client and a better decision for the client than the investment pathway process. So it's an RU64 for the 2020s. But it's not the only one. This seems to be an emerging theme from the FCA. The new transfer um, defined benefit advice rules, the defined benefit transfer advice rules, um, came in in October this year. And they also say that if there is a personal recommendation to transfer to a particular destination, 
then that destination has to be better than any workplace pension scheme offered to the client. So again, it's another RU64 rule. And it's not going to stop there. Investment pathways have been introduced for drawdown um, pots and for drawdown um, accounts. But the FCA is at the moment considering how they could work for non-workplace pensions. So for SIPs, personal pensions, other individual pension contracts, and whether they can introduce default investment solutions for those particular types of contract. If they do, then if you're giving a personal recommendation on a SIP investment, maybe in the future you're going to have to demonstrate why that would be better than the default investment pathway. Now that brings me very neatly onto my final section. I'm going to look at where next for defaults and guidance. Investment pathways is part of a whole bag of initiatives and strategies that the DWP, the SCA and the pension regulator is considering. All of these parties want to make sure that customers make better decisions, whether they're advised or non-advised. So they're keen on making sure that people get the help when they need it. A lot of this is trying to push people towards um, PensionWise to help them get the guidance they need to make these key decisions, especially the ones around how to access pension funds and what decisions they should be making, whether it's drawdown, taking the full amount as cash, or whether they should be buying an annuity. So there are various initiatives either in play at the moment or being worked on by the regulators and the DWP. We've seen changes to wake up packs, and we've seen introducing of investment pathways. There's also going to be work done on something called stronger nudges. Now, stronger nudges means putting an intervention just at the point when the person wants to take their um, access their pension fund to try and push them towards pension guidance. So this is for non-advised customers, and what we're trying to do is to say to them, listen, if you just stay on the phone, I will transfer you to pension guidance, and you can set up an appointment to see them there. Or if you want, I can go online and set up an appointment for you. So it's pushing them towards pension guidance by offering an appointment with them. But there are some people who think that won't go far enough, and it's not going to achieve anything. And what they would like to see is automatic appointments made with PensionWise. So a non-advised customer could say, right, OK, I would like to access my fund. I'd like to take this amount of tax-free cash, put the rest into drawdown. And at that point, an automatic appointment will be made with Pension Guidance, with PensionWise. And the person will have to almost opt out of it or keep it. But that way, the regulators and the DWP hope that people will get more information and more help on this key decision. But as I said before, it's only on the, the key decision. And really, when you think about drawdown, every year there are key decisions. So we should be thinking about how to make sure people get help year on year on year. So for this session, hopefully now you understand what the new process is for advisor clients and how providers could be exempt. You and you're able to say how that you may be affected with it and what challenges you may face. And you can also identify other changes that the government and regulators are considering with default funds and guidance. Investment Pathways is a big initiative for the FCA and it's going to be interesting to see how this works in practice. I think it will be very useful for some non-advised customers and they will benefit from it. But not all of them. Some of them, it, it, won't be, it won't matter and it won't be of any use to them, either because they choose just not to engage full stop or because they are already engaged and they already know what they want to do with their investments and how they want to invest their drawdown money. I hope you found this interesting. If you have any questions, then please do get in touch and stay healthy. Thanks very much.